folks who are doing really critical work in this area um, and also um, engaging you in conversations about community policing and uh, fire safety. So without further ado, I'm going to extend this panel to my dear friend Anthony McCarthy, who I believe is making one of his first appearances since having a struggle with his health. So I'm so grateful that you're well. I'm so grateful that you're here, and I'm so grateful that you're sharing your gifts with us today. So I'm going to let you take it over from here. Everyone, Anthony McCarthy, WEAA Radio. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on. I know it's the last panel. Good afternoon. Yeah. Public <laughs> As April said, about three and a half weeks ago, I had a minor stroke. But to look at me now, could you imagine? Anyway, anyway, I just, God is very good. This is an important conversation we're about to have, and um, some of the most important people involved in this issue. And so I am just honored to moderate this conversation and definitely look forward to your involvement and your engagement with these outstanding individuals. But before we do that, could we give April Yvonne Garrett a round of applause? She has been absolutely incredible. And how she has managed to um, engage so many people from so many different um, areas of our city, of our community, of our region, and having a conversation about the kind of Baltimore we envision, the kind of Baltimore we have, and how do we celebrate, how do we amplify the great resources and opportunities we have as a city. Um, too often, for far too long, when it comes to issues of public safety, many people see things as kind of black and white, cut and dry. Uh, we are very quick to assess blame and assign blame when things are going wrong or communities are having challenges, but we never really take an opportunity to pat people on their back for the investment that they make in our city, the investment um, and heart and love that they give to this city. Well, the individuals that are going to share some time with you, and many of you in this audience who have worked in your neighborhoods, in your communities, um, who've taken responsibility for the quality of life that we enjoy here and that we want to see here. So all of us are in this together. And so we're going to have a conversation, a very honest and frank conversation, about our past as a city and many of the hurdles that we've had to jump, um, our current situation and some of the successes we have, and then what is the Baltimore that you dream of? What is the Baltimore you see? What is the Baltimore that we can become? So it's going to be a great conversation. So I invite our panel to join me um, uh, on the stage. So you can come now. Just come this way up. Choose any seat you like. And again, as April said, thank you all for hanging in here. It's been a long day, a great day, great conversations. I'm going to introduce the panel, um, and as April said, if we get the video um, situation fixed and worked out, there's an incredible presentation that you have to see involving the young people of our city, so we're going to show that as well. Let me introduce to you Cleo Walker, the chair of the Civilian Review Board for the City of Baltimore. You, you can applaud. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this because I am objective at all times on my program and in these public talks, but I believe we have the best police commissioner in the country, the leader of our Baltimore City Police Department, Fred Biefeld. Followed by an incredible chief of our Baltimore City Fire Department, James Clack. Thank you. John uh, Kowalczyk, Sergeant, Neighborhood Services, Southern District, Baltimore City Police Department. Jonathan T. Bryce, the Executive Director of Student Support and Safety for the Baltimore City Public Schools. Thank you, John. <laughs> Marcus Dent, um, he's with the Baltimore Guardian Angels. Marcus, thanks for being here. <laughs> Margaret Barillaro, Major District Commander of the Southern District with the Baltimore City Police Department. I hope I didn't do too bad, Margaret. <laughs> 
And uh, I think Stephen Janis is on his way, so when he joins us, we'll bring him to the panel. Um, and, uh, so let's begin our conversation. Be thinking of your questions. I only have a couple um, to begin the conversation. Uh, but let's begin with this idea, as I mentioned in our opening, that for decades, public safety has been a huge issue, a great distraction for many um, in the city of Baltimore. And as we begin to, as a city, uh, put a lot of attention on violence and the quality of life that we want here, we sometimes don't acknowledge that people are really working night and day, including the people on this panel, the guardian angels and, and other community leaders, politicians, policy wonks, neighborhood leaders, working very hard to make our city safe, to make our community safe, um, to change and improve the quality of life. But too often, we kind of work, and I've learned this phrase from April, we work in our own individual silos. It's my community. I don't have time to worry about your community. I'm just worried about my community. Um, there are a lot of things that we don't seem to come together on. But one of the things that's been a constant in our conversations about public safety has been this perceived wall between those who work in public safety, those who work at the fire department, those who work in these uh, in these positions where they oversee um, our judicial system and others, there's this disconnect, this wall that separates citizens from the police, the fire, and others, um, politicians who are working on these issues. Now, whether that perception is real or it's just a perception, it really is one of the reasons that I think a lot of people are very quick to believe that a police officer did something wrong uh, because there isn't the relationship that we need between citizens and um, those who are protecting and serving us. How do we begin to pierce that wall? How do we begin to tell the whole story about the people who serve the city and the citizens who um, really need that relationship? And of course, we'll start with our commissioner, Fred Biafel. So first of all, I, I wanna thank uh, Amplify Baltimore for putting together this, this um, panel and certainly this discussion for uh, throughout the day. You hope that um, the, the tone of this and the sound of this resonates across the city and has some, some long-lasting affect. Um, I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna try to jump into this thing uh, from a couple different angles. And one of them is the power of people's uh, perceptions and the, the genesis of that. And then the second part is uh, where do you really, how do you really make a change and how, do, how are we achieving the results um, that, that we've seen over the last three and a half years? So the first part is that I have a very good friend of mine who runs a business and they're on the, his business is on the verge of international. They just exceeded one billion in sales. Um, he's on the verge of creating the new Nike of our generation. He has a philosophy inside his company, and the philosophy is no loser talk. It's not allowed. No loser talk. They're allowed to talk about ideas and, and how to improve their operations and how to make the company better, and certainly they identify problems. But he just won't allow loser talk. And I think... I think, listen, I've never been police chief any, anywhere else. I've never been a police officer anywhere else. But I know from talking to people from Philadelphia, from Washington, D.C., from New York City, they just are not so uh, self-defeated. They're not so full of self-loathing the way you find Baltimoreans. It's not just in the police department. I'll give you an interesting phenomenon. Tomorrow... The Baltimore Ravens are going to play, the, I think, the third or fourth consecutive year in playoff football. And I've listened all year long to sports radio. It's not, not even public safety. It's just something completely away from public safety. And I do it for a break. But I hear these people calling and bashing that team about they didn't win big enough. Oh, they're not good enough. They Flacco stinks. Cam Cameron, he's horrible. And they're just so full of this defeated mentality. And I, what I don't hear is people saying, it only takes one point to win. They won. They're in the championship three years in a row. No rookie quarterback's ever done that. And they're talking about replacing Joe Flacco. So I think that we really, 
we really must challenge ourselves first, not in a collective way, not just because you can't start by saying, how are you going to fix the police department? How are you going to fix the schools? How are you going to fix um, the Southern District? You know, you have to fix yourself first, Anthony. And people really have to examine themselves and say, okay, maybe I tend to look at this situation half empty more often than I should. And if we're going to move forward, I have to start focusing on where the positive things are, not because it's self-delusion, but because there's traction in the positive. Traction in the positive. You can't get economic investment without it. You can't get other people in this room or in your community without it. That's, that's the first part. The second part is then, we have to figure out, the leaders and the people who are committed, to figure out how to move beyond this incessant, nonstop talk. I'm just sick of the talk, frankly. I'm, I'm here, and I will come again, and I will come again and again and again and again and again and again, but we're trying to move beyond the talk. And I think that's where we've shown some results in the last three years, because we've not lamented We've not lamented the homicide rate. We said, shut up and start doing something about it. Shut up and start getting out in these communities and start walking with these folks. Now, are we where we want to be on any of those issues? No, definitely not. But it's got to be about the work. We must leave here and other meetings and other discussions with some kind of idea about how we're going to make work into that. So, that's right. Thank you. And now, let's ask Chief Clack to address this idea, this perception uh, about Baltimore and the disconnect between our citizens and those of you who serve uh, the citizens. Well, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with the police commissioner. He is uh, quite a leader uh, in being able to see through uh, the negativity and looking at the positive. In Baltimore, 25 years ago, we were losing 80 people a year in fires. The last two years, we lost 19. Uh, that's not good. Zero is good. But we've made tremendous progress. Uh, the fire service has changed from putting out fires to doing a lot of EMS work, a lot of medical work, with a part-time uh, job of putting out fires. Fires are down. They've been down, going down for years and years. Uh, we used to have 3,000 firefighters in this city. Now we have about 1,500. Uh, so our business is changing. And one of the things I'm trying to convince my folks is that it's all about relationship. We're out knocking on doors. What we need citizens to do is when we knock on the door and say, can we come in and check your smoke alarm just to make sure it works? Can we help you put a CO alarm in? Can we check that crib? that you got that baby in to make sure that that baby's safe. In other words, our job is evolving into risk management, but we need to get in the door. And so that's where I'm trying to get my folks more engaged in convincing people to let them in the door. And then on the other side of the fence, when you come to the fire station, I want the door to be open to you. Uh, there's a perception, I think, that our fire stations are off limits. They're not. They're public buildings, just like schools. Uh, they need to be open, and people need to feel comfortable coming in. One of the things I did when I got here is put up signs on every fire station. If you want your blood pressure checked, just knock on the door. Come on in. We'll do it for free. And so uh, developing relationships with the community, getting out of the station and knocking on doors, and trying to figure out ways we can become value added, not just when you have a fire or a heart attack or uh, something happens to you that we show up, but we get there and prevent things from happening before they ever happen. Marcus Dent, I'd be very interested in your perspective, um, a community group, a community patrol. Uh, we've had some problems in the last couple of uh, weeks around those issues. Give us your perception. What is this disconnect that is perceived between the community, um, law enforcement? You can see it from both perspectives, I guess. Yeah, uh, being a, a guardian angel, one of the good things about it is I have the benefit of working with the police department. 
and also working with the community. So uh, we started this chapter here in Baltimore in 06, and, and my twin brother and I were the original members of the Guardian Angels in the 80s. And one of the things that we decided to do when we started the Guardian Angels this time around was not to be the kind of community crime watch group that just walked the streets and with no communication. What we found out this time was that when we started, the first thing we did was we met with the police department, the city hall, the mayor's office, and most of my guardian angels all live in surrounding counties. I maybe have one guardian angel that lives in Baltimore City. But the thing about it is, because of that, you know, we also have an impression of Baltimore City of what everybody else is. Now, Baltimore was bad, Baltimore was this, Baltimore was that. But one of the things we did was we came in, we started going to all the community meetings. We met with all the police departments. Poli Commissioner Bill Felt let us meet with all the majors. So here we're communicating with them, and one of the things that it taught me was that if we'd have done this years ago in the 1980s as Guardian Angels, the Guardian Angels would have never left Baltimore. So the thing that we need to do, and one of the things that we do in the Guardian Angels, when we go to any community, go to any business, or talk to anybody, the first thing we do is to promote communication within the police department and also community involvement. The best way that I see to get Baltimore on the same playing field is to, is to go out and, and, and go to the communities. Find that one individual in that community that says, hey, you know what, I want to do something. I don't have to join the Guardian Angels, but I want to do something. Okay, well, good. Talk to your neighbors. We'll all get together. But that one person's got to get everybody else involved. And once you do, and everybody's involved, and everybody's on the same page, and they learn about what the police department's doing, what public safety is about, what each community is doing to benefit, and they're learning, and you implement these things, that's how you're going to change Baltimore. It's not going to change by putting 50 cops on the street or 10,000 chapters of Guardian Angels. The community has to step up and say, look, we want to make a change. We want to get involved. What is it we have to do? And it can be as, as little as going to your community meeting, starting a community meeting, starting a community association, meeting with your, your neighborhood service police officer, or going to your fire department. That's how you start, start to make a change. You've got to educate people on what it is they can do within their community. And one of the things that, that the Guardian Angels have found out, and we meet all the time, and we talk about this, you know, this guy wants to call and they call the guardian angels. First thing they think is, we're gonna go out and we're gonna fight crime, we're gonna grab guys, we're gonna throw them to the ground. You know, the police department has nothing to do with it. Wrong. You know, as soon as we go to a new community, we contact the police department. Hey, this community called us, this is what they got going on. The police department tells us what the issues are, they tell us who the community leaders are. We then meet with those people. But it's, it's a great big networking thing, and, and I'm telling you, and I encourage everybody here, Go to one of your community meetings, go to the police community meeting. They have them every month in all the districts. And watch how much you learn about your neighbors, the police department, and actually what is going on. It's like you said, there's so much going on in Baltimore that nobody sees. So we have to go out and let people know, this is what's out there. Go check it out. Hmm. But that's how we're gonna, gonna change Baltimore. Thank you, Marcus. Let's turn to the chair of our Civilian Review Board, Cleo Walker. The Civilian Review Board, I guess a lot of people have a perception of what your group does. Um, one of the partners and watchdogs over the police department. Give me your perception. Then we're going to turn to the sergeant major and, and our representative from the police, um, from the school system as well. The Civilian Review Board is a permanent statutory agency in Baltimore City which allows citizens to file complaints against law enforcement units under our jurisdiction, which is the Baltimore City Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, and the school police. Um, when complaints are filed, we can either sustain a complaint, we can not sustain a complaint, or we can exonerate a complaint. And when we sustain a complaint, we are saying that there is enough evidence brought before us and that there's no reasonable doubt that this allegation did occur. When we not sustain, we say there's not enough proof to say that it happened or it did not happen. When we exonerate, we say that the allegation happened, but the officer or the law enforcement person was within their rights. Um, the Civilian Re Review Board provides oversight to the citizens of Baltimore. And our complaint is that there must be a partnership. I would love to see the Civilian Review Board to go out of business, work itself out of business. We are committed to promote trust and respect between the citizens and law enforcement. And I want to say to you that there are nine police districts in this city. The Civilian Review Board has nine openings at this current time. 
So if you are interested, I would encourage you to submit a cover letter and a resume to Alvin Gillard and Community Relations, attention of the C Civilian Review Board, and we call that the CRB, as soon as possible. They have uh, 13 applications and they will be rev uh, reviewing those applications and will be calling people in for um, interviews. I was selected to be on the board for three years, representing the Southern District, and I've been on almost 12 years. So uh, <laughs> I need somebody to step up to the plate. If you're willing to review cases, if you're willing to speak out against policies that you think does not benefit the citizens of Baltimore, and if you're sitting here and you're concerned about this great city, and I think that we're su supposed to say that this is a good city, we have to speak it. Yeah. And in order to speak it, you have to believe it that it's going to happen. And that means that we have to come from behind our doors. And that we have to not allow ourselves to be afraid. I used to be probably like somebody sitting here. I used to be afraid until one day I saw a 13-year-old boy shot down in the street. And I said, you know, I can't sit back and hide behind my door. I have to come out and do something about it. I miss death threats and I miss my family members being assaulted. It didn't matter because I knew that I'd rather be buried in my grave to, to be afraid to come out and speak out for my city, a good city. Sure, there are good citizens and there are bad citizens, but we, we know that the majority of people in Baltimore City are concerned, law-abiding citizens. God gives us a choice of free will. There you're gonna find people who choose to do things that are not beneficial to the city of Baltimore, and those are the ones we need to speak out against. And we should not sit back and be afraid. We have to stand together. No man is an island and no man can stand alone. So we all have to work together. Working together works. And we have to trust, respect one another, love one another. I heard Ronnie King once say, why can't we all get together? And I do have to say tonight that I believe that we are beginning to see trust and respect among citizens and law enforcement within this city because I can sit here tonight and tell you that our complaints have gone down 31%. And you know, policing, good policing is everybody's business. It's the police's business and it's your business. So I'm asking you to go back to your neighborhoods and go back to your, your families and friends and say to them, it's time for you to step up to the plate. This is our city and we have a responsibility to have people involved in our city. And it's time for us to take our city back. It's ours. Thank you, Ms. Walker. <laughs> Before we move on to the next topic, I want to give a chance to Major um, Vera Lara um, and Sergeant um, Kowalczyk um, to share their thoughts, as well as our good friend um, Jonathan from the um, City Public Schools. How, what are you doing, let's start with you, Major, in your district? Um, to build relationships, dispel myths and ideas and perceptions, um, and really move your district forward um, in their relationship with the people that you, obviously, after all these years, she's an incredible, incredible major, um, that you've been involved in this process. How are you building relationships in your district? In the Southern District, which I can speak to, I would say that we have the strongest community council uh, membership and the most active, and by far it's because we do our part, but it's really about the citizens that live in the Southern District. They really care, and they fight every single day for their neighborhood. And they'll be the first to defend us when we've done something that um, is questioned by the citizens, and they'll be the first ones to point out when we've done something wrong. And we have a strong enough relationship that that's okay. That's what it's built on. It's built on that open communication. And by far, that's why we've enjoyed the successes that we've enjoyed in the Southern District. Uh, we have the most people come to once a month on the third Thursday of every month in the Southern District. We have our community council meeting and it is, it is attended by, I would say on the average, maybe 40 people. That is a lot of people to come out to attend that. Uh, we also have COP walks, which are the citizens on patrol, and our citizens come faithfully and we have those five, four days a week. Faithfully, the people from the neighborhoods in the Southern District, they respond, they come and they walk with the police officer and it's built purely on their involvement, and then they make us want to be involved with them. I would say that it's built, that way it creates or fosters the relationship that they don't just call us when they need us, 
they come out and see us as people walking with them, caring about their neighborhoods. And that's made all the difference in the world. It's about partnerships. Sergeant, your thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have the uh, Southern District Neighborhood Services Unit, because as the Major said, we do have probably the strongest relationship of any um, neighborhood services unit and group of citizens in the city. Um, one of the things that we try to do to maintain that is to develop those one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, I have four officers that are liaisons that work for me, and we make it a point to not only um, interact with people at the meetings, but we'll go to their homes. Um, more people in the district have my cell phone number than I realized. We answer the phone uh, whenever they call. Those relationships are important. If you're going to engage in a neighborhood services type of environment, you have to be willing to have that relationship. They have to be able to see past the badge and recognize that we're people. And then once you start to develop that relationship, then you can get into explaining. And one of the things that we do at our council meeting, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, every three months is we'll do a um, ask and answer session where we'll put on skits and we'll demonstrate um, what a car stop looks like and we'll ask people questions about, well, you've heard this and you've had this bad experience and you've heard this rumor from a friend. Let's walk through that and talk about that. And when you have those personal relationships that we've, we've started to develop with the community and are trying to develop even more, when you answer those questions, it doesn't look like you're just trying to um, cover up what happened, but they actually are willing to listen to you and, and accept that explanation. And a lot of times, the, um, that wall that's there, it's a miscommunication. Somebody sees one thing, we do one thing, they don't understand why we did what we did, and when you're able to walk through that and explain to them, we performed this action because of this reason, and you have that personal relationship, and they're willing to listen to it, it breaks down those barriers. So the most important thing that I think we do is try to develop those one-on-one -on -one relationships with people in our district. Um, Jonathan Bryce is the Executive Director of Student Support and Safety at our city public school system. Jonathan, you probably, because you've been active in this city, you've seen and heard about this disconnect, the perception of the disconnect. Um, and some people still today would tell you that our police officers, uh, firefighters, that our mayor, that they don't get it. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, let me just start off by saying thank you for inviting uh, city schools to be on this panel. Uh, initially, uh, it may appear to some folks to be incongruent. What, what do schools have to do with public safety? Um, but I'll tell you, 83,000 students are on the move Monday through Fridays, and if we aren't teaching those young people to do the right things and to be good citizens, uh, they're going to walk through our neighborhoods and they're going to do things that are going to require school police or city police or the fire department to have to respond. Um, and so we just want to make sure that everyone understands that we recognize our role in helping to make our young people uh, great citizens. Let me start with a couple of things. Um, on behalf of our school CEO, Dr. Andres Alonzo, who couldn't be here, he's addressing new members of Congress this weekend. Um, it, it really is a pleasure to be on this panel. But let me start with this. You can't have a great city, and we all believe Baltimore is a great city. You can't have a great city without great schools. And the, the slogan for, for city schools is great kids, great schools, because we, we had to stop the loser talk. We had to stop the perception that our kids are bad, that our kids can't learn, our kids can't be successful. And what we had to realize is that we have a role in helping young people to learn productive norms of behavior. The society that our young people inhabit um, teaches them some things that we don't want them to, to know. And so when they come to our schools, we have to spend a lot of time redirecting them and teaching them, here's, uh, when you are in school, here is how we expect you to conduct yourself. And we believe that not only is going to have a benefit instructionally and in school, but it also has a long-term benefit to the society. If we're helping young people to grow up and to know how to conduct themselves along with their parents and the broader community, that's less people for the commissioner to have to deal with um, that are out on the streets doing things that we don't want them to do. And so I would tell you that there are three things that City Schools is really focused on that we see as being helpful, not just to us, but also to the city as a whole. Number one is keeping more students in school. When students are not in school, and I'll just say this for the group, over winter holiday, we had four students in City Schools that died because of violence, all right? Four. The reality is when young people are not in school, they are much more likely to be the victims or the perpetrator of juvenile crime up to and including homicide. So we, first and foremost, we've gotta keep them in school. 
Number two, we have to reduce the number of out of school suspensions. It's just like the drug issue. You cannot arrest your way out of it. You cannot think that you can incarcerate your way out of it. What we had to realize in city schools is that our young people are making, in some cases, bad decisions. We need to work with them, redirect them, help them to understand what the decision they made, why it was wrong, and redirect them and give them the appropriate consequence. And then the last thing that really bodes well for Baltimore City as a whole and city schools is that our dropout rate has decreased and our graduation rate has increased, especially among African American males. And so what that really means is that the people who would, uh, in some cases, be more likely to get themselves involved in uh, illicit behavior, all right, because they are staying in school, because they are earning credits, because they are graduating, because they're going on to college and to careers and, and, and into the military, are less likely to become members of this underclass that, that we end up having to deal with. And so that's city schools' contribution. Um, and we believe that our efforts over the last three years have really made a difference, not just to our own bottom line, but to the bottom line of the community as a whole. Thank you very much. So you all can just clap. You don't have to be timid. Just jump right in there and clap if, if you support what's being said. Um, I want to ask another question, um, and then we're going to turn this over to all the wonderful people in the audience. And commissioners, this, this is going to sound a little like loser talk in the beginning, but I'll get it around to uh, making my point at the end of the question. A lot of the issues we talk about when it comes to public safety um, in the city of Baltimore and a lot of the hurdles that we are constantly jumping as a society and as, as a community are tied directly to not just the issues we face in Baltimore, but the issues we face as a country, a lot of social ills that cause men and women um, in our society when they are given a choice, a choice to make a positive decision and a negative decision, um, they make a negative decision. Breaking the window out of someone's car may not seem like a very serious thing, but it impacts the person whose window you don't want. Um, but a lot of people talk about our children being safe and our schools being safe from bullies and um, predators. They talk about the long-term effect that so many families and citizens in Baltimore have faced due to addictions to drugs and alcohol. They talk about the extreme large population that deal with poverty and hunger every day in our city. Um, they talk about class distinctions, racial problems in our city. We have a huge population that is undereducated, who don't seem like they have the key to find the opportunities that other people are finding because they feel or they're perceived as being uneducated or undereducated, they're unemployed. Um, gangs seem to revel in violence in our city. And those social ills that are packing every city, every urban area of our country, really makes it a huge, huge um, hurdle when it comes to be creating communities that are safe and thriving. A lot of people call those excuses because you're an addict, because you're involved in alcohol, because you're involved and in, you're unemployed. Those are excuses for making bad choices. Whether they're excuses or not, they impact what's going on in our community. As I look at this panel and the success, and not just the personal success, and, uh, but in your career, but all of you seem to possess this, whatever, my mom used to call it razzmatazz. You possess whatever that quality is that makes you stand up and say, if no one else is willing to do this, I'm willing to do this. If no one else is willing to go, I'll go. Uh, what is your personal philosophy about how you overcome these social issues? Because we're going to have to find a way for people to find the fortitude to change their lives if we're going to have a long lasting, if we're going to have a serious um, impact on public safety in our community. And I want to start with the major this time. Um, how do you attack, overcome personal problems and challenges? Major. I, I think you have to break it down into little pieces. And I think you just have to do something and in a community. I, I, it doesn't have to be the big thing. It can be as easy as being nice, being extra nice to the person on the street that's not able to get out or the child on the street that looks like they don't have the parent that's involved a whole lot in their life. Um, and it's about not judging, not being so judgmental. We don't know where that person's coming from or what they're bringing to the, the their office the next day or to school the next morning or even to work in the police department. 
everybody has a burden they're carrying. And I think it's just about being a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more caring, a little bit more open. Um, we don't know. You know, if you haven't walked in that person's shoes, you have no idea the pain that they're bringing or the joy that they could bring to a, to a situation. So I think tolerance is probably the biggest thing that um, I see that I wish that I had more of sometimes. Um, I know you say razzmatazz. I think tolerance would probably be a, a great as a, a great trait that uh, I think everybody could have more of. I think tolerance about the inequalities that have happened uh, in your past or that are lurking around the corner, maybe. But I, I just think tolerance. I would say. How about you, Marcus Dent? Well, I think you talk about what drives an individual. It's it's hard to say, and and you know I read a. Uh, uh, April's uh, bio and, and you see all the things that she's done and it, I guess each individual is different. You know, in my, in my case, I've always wanted to be the kind of person that I want people to see when they look at me. And that's the same way we do with the guardian angels. I mean, you know, I was raised by my mother and grandmother and two strong sisters. So, you know, it's hard for me to, to deal with that whole there's no man in the house type thing. You know, because at the same time, Everybody inside of us. It's, it's up to us whether we, we take that wrong road or we take that right road. It's up to us what we want to do. But, you know, I've always wanted people to see me as the kind of person where, where, where they can be proud of. And, and you see, it's one of those things where if you are a positive person, positive people will come toward you. And because of that, you know, they themselves become positive. So basically, even positive and negative, everybody we come across in life, we affect one way or the other. My personal choice is I want to affect everybody in a positive way. So, and, and, and that, that's one of the things that you do. That's why with, with Baltimore City Schools, you got good teachers who do things with students. You got tons of volunteers. You, you got people, everybody here, I mean, including the police department, everybody talks about how they work. This is their job. You know, at the same time, I've been lucky enough to call these guys on or off the clock, and they've always answered. Same thing with the fire department. We, we've done some stuff with some guys in Moore Park. It's the individual that you look at and what, what I would hope that you could do is find them positive people, as I said before, and promote them to go out and create more positive people. And you don't have to work at it. Just be there. Jonathan Bryce, um, how can we, and let me kind of nuance the question even more. We know about the social ills that I just talked about. People are always looking for someone to come. Every child I meet is looking for someone that inspires them. That someone that says, you know what, if he can make it, if she can overcome that addiction, if, if he can uh, overcome his family situation and still thrive, then I can do it. Um, what's your personal philosophy about overcoming challenges? So my, my personal philosophy, um, having grown up in Baltimore, graduated from Baltimore City Schools, I'm a Mervo grad, um, is that it is about one adult and one activity. And let me explain what I mean. Every student, all 83,000 of our young people, they need one caring, committed adult in their life that says, it's going to be okay. I know you're having a bad day, but we can get through this. They need one caring adult in their life, and they need one engaging activity that causes them to go left instead of go right. What does that mean? Well, that means that instead of them hanging out on the corner, getting involved in illegal activities or bad activities, they've got a productive uh, activity to go to after school, whether that be the drama club, whether that be the chess club, robotics, football, some athletic team, whatever it is, but one activity and one caring, committed person. And, and that's the philosophy that we have attempted to build in city schools that there is a place for every young person and that schools have a responsibility to know who their kids are, know what issues they're dealing with, so that not that we can excuse their behavior, but so that we can understand it, so that we can design uh, uh, programs that will help them to be successful. And the last thing I would say, for the kids that I, I, I encounter in Baltimore City, and it runs the gamut, I deal with kids that are at some of our greatest high schools, like one sitting in the office, in the audience, who's the president of our student government, to kids who are incarcerated in an adult facility at the Baltimore City detentions, and, and everything in between. 
But here's what I know about the students in Baltimore, that they are resilient, that they are willing to fight tooth and nail to become successful and to achieve, and that it's up to the adults, whether they be in the school system, in the broader community, in government, police agency, the fire department, everywhere, to help young people to reach their potential because they are resilient. They just need that one person. Chief Clack, your idea, I know. Um, you grew up in Minnesota? Yes. I'm not sure how many challenges you faced in cold Minnesota, but um, we talk about social ills. We talk about, there are some people who just deal with situations differently. How do you teach your firefighters? How do you inspire your firefighters that anything can be overcome? Because people who are stuck in situations like we talked about, addiction, um, unemployment, poverty, oftentimes turn crime and bad decisions. They just do. Now that doesn't happen always. I was a poor kid. We missed meals almost every day when I was a kid because we were just poor. And my mother said that no matter what, don't you bring no shame on this house. That's right. And so we knew we had a right decision to make because the wrong decision wasn't an option. What's your personal philosophy? And what do you tell your firefighters about making good choices um, that impact everyone? Well, I, I did grow up in Minnesota, but I, I started my life in California, in Fresno, California, uh -oh. um, which uh, was at the time, uh, per capita, the highest murder rate in the country, bar none. Uh, my, my high school had uh, Constantina wire around the whole school. We had narcotics officers and, pl and plain clothes police officers all over the school. There was race riots, uh, fights in the city park every night, it seemed like. Uh, so I, I came from that background growing up in, in, um, in a pretty uh, tough, tough school. And then I moved to Minnesota, and, and Minnesota's a different place. <laughs> uh, then when I decided to come to Baltimore, you know, the same, uh, I guess, flashbacks uh, to being a kid in an environment where you had to watch your back constantly. Uh, and growing up in that environment, I just made the decision as a young man to First of all, not be afraid to get involved, to support the person that I'm with or the people I'm with and not focus too much on the big picture. Um, 10 years ago or so, I had the opportunity to go to Haiti um, before the earthquake um, and saw so many people living in poverty and a place that is much, much, much worse off than Baltimore City or any, any uh, city in this country. But the joy of the people who had nothing and were in an environment that, that uh, again, uh, no food, a lot of disease, no jobs, um, faith, helping each other, picking each other up, singing, dancing, being friendly. Uh, Mother Teresa, I'm Roman Catholic, so she's one of my heroes in Calcutta. You know, she was asked, how can you work in such devastation? And she said, well, I just work with the person in front of me. I, I don't worry about the other million. Um, and I think that's really key for all of us is to take the little spot we are in the world and make it better, make somebody's life better, stay upbeat, as the commissioner said, uh, you know, stay optimistic. I tell firefighters, we're in charge of our own morale. You know, I, I hear once in a while a firefighter say, you know, my morale's kind of down. I'm taking furlough days or, you know, uh, I wish there wasn't rotating closures, whatever the issue is. And uh, so what can you do to increase my morale? I can't do a thing for you. All I can do is tell you, you got a job. You live in the best country in the world. Yep. Uh, there's people around here you're helping every day. People love you. And you look at the citizen survey of city services, we're number one. People love us. They think we do a great job. What more can you ask for in, a, in a, an economy like this? You got a job. Come on. Get, you know, get up. Uh, so that's my philosophy is I, I think that um, I wish that more people that work for me and more people in general could go places that are much worse off so that they could realize that what we've got here is pretty good. Uh, Ms. Walker and then Sergeant. I believe that there is apathy and dismay and hopelessness in our city, but there's also joy in 
I believe that each one of us can show compassion and care and love to one another. And we can even start with ourselves. Tomorrow morning when you get up, look in the mirror and look at yourself and say to yourself, I am created for goodness. I am good. I am somebody. I was created to be somebody. And believe that. And then go to someone in your family or to someone on the street, whether it's at work, your neighbor, and say to them, I love you. God loves you. You are somebody. You are beautiful. And I think you can be, you'll be able to see that hope begin to nestle in their bosom. And, and, and they might change their way of living or they might change their way of thinking. I remember not too long ago, there was a young lady at a service station. And I could tell she was high. And she came over to me and she said, I need you to pray for me. And I stopped pumping gas and I did. And I, I said, you know what, you like getting high? She said, yeah. I said, well, I'll tell you what, give me your address. And I'm going to take you to the highest high that you ever had in your life. You're going to feel real good. And I went, got her and took her to church. <laughs> and today, she's a member of the church. church. So I think it's about <laughs> us showing love and, and showing compassion. The, the, the Bible says that we will go through some trials and some tribulations in life, but we don't have to stay there. So I think it's about the joy that is in us, and we cannot let anyone take our joy, no matter what. So tomorrow, do that. Look in the mirror, and then go tell somebody, I love you. Give them a hug, and you'll see hope. I want you all to do that tomorrow. <laughs> no, matter, no matter where you live, I want you to do that. Um, Sergeant, give me your thoughts on how you've overcome challenges, what's your personal philosophy, recognizing, and then we're going to go to the commission, recognizing that a lot of people in our city are facing extraordinary circumstances that unfortunately cause them to make decisions that impact them. So I, uh, I thank God every day I wake up that I get to do this job. I really do. Um, I was homeless when I was 17. So I've gone through adversity and some struggles. And I try to bring that empathy and understanding to what I do and the people that I deal with. Because um, you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know people's backgrounds. And that's the, that's the key to um, how I approach people initially. You can be the most violent offender in the city. You can be the nicest person in the world. I don't know that until I get to talk to you. So I try to be empathetic with everyone that I deal with until I get to know. And if I have to take you to jail, I have to take you to jail. And if, if you turn out to be somebody that's going to come to our community meeting, you come to our community meeting. Um, but it does mean no good to get out of my car and walk up to somebody and treat them like they're the most violent offender in the city when I don't know what their background is. Um, and they don't know mine. And they don't know the struggles that I've had to go through. Um, that's part of it. The other part at the uh, um, risk of being laughed at, I'm a big believer in the movie Pay It Forward. Um, I think that, um, and a lot of people up here have said it, if I have the opportunity to impact one person's life in a positive manner, and then they can do that and do that, I think that's how you start to build real change. Um, the idea of looking at a problem from the, the macro side and saying, we have this huge drug problem in Baltimore City, how do we fix it? Um, and we can debate issues and socioeconomic issues and whether arresting is the right answer or treatment or early diversion. There are all types of philosophies out there. But until you start to get down to the individual level and understand people's backgrounds and their experiences and deal with the individual and try to fix that problem on an individual basis, um, I don't think that you're going to have any real success. So I think it is about, um, for me, it's being empathetic towards people, trying to understand who they are, where they've come from and dealing with that situation as you see it in front of you. Commissioner, I, I want to ask you the same question. Your personal philosophy on life, but I also want to add, this is when you're the boss, I have to add a caveat, is what do you say, what, what are you teaching our officers about these problems that we outlined? We know they're huge problems, drugs, um, poverty, class. Um, I guess a lot of people wonder, I would wonder, if you come on my show, I would ask you um, this idea of how do you make a decision? How do you find the balance of when to bring the hammer down um, or when to say, look, this person really has faced some extraordinary challenges. Um, we're going to have to do something different here. Yeah, right. So, um, wow, it always seems like my mic's so much louder. <laughs> um, 
so on a personal level, um, I remember as a kid that, um, you know, you need to know a little bit about my background. I grew up in a, in a blue collar family, six kids, just my dad working. He was in the construction industry. And um, I have a high school education, you know? And um, I remember being, you know, young and naive and incredibly uh, immature. And uh, I was applying to different schools around. And, uh, you know, you're getting this flood of rejection letters. And um, my father is not a, a, a hugger <laughs> and um, not a, a, a person who shares much emotionally. And um, he said, listen, you need to stop pitying yourself and um, you need to commit yourself to one thing. And that is whatever you're going to be, whatever it is, ditch digger, b bridge builder, whatever it is you're, you are, wind up being, be the best damn one. And so uh, as, a, as a personal kind of philosophy and moving myself through, I, I've just never been intimidated by the next level. I've looked at people and look, I don't, I don't see myself being US Senator or, or President. I don't aspire to any of those things. I aspired to be a cop. But along the way, I looked at guys and he or she was a sergeant. I thought, you know, I could do that. And then the next level, I saw lieutenants as he or she's a lieutenant. I could do that. And so I didn't hold myself back from that. I mean, when I, that's tough to convince people of, right? Because that's got to be at the core of who you are. What I'm looking for, though, rather, in my cops is that um, they have a sense of service. They, they have to be committed to service. And what drives them through that, right, whether it's, you know, social crusading, personal, personal philosophy, whatever it is, that's got to be the, the, uh, where they're trying to drive the bus to, this, this sense of service. We talk to the young men and women who line up in our lobby a couple nights a week, and we're trying to hire 300 cops, and I ask them why they're there. And um, it usually takes me three, four, maybe sometimes longer before I hear the S word. And a lot of them are talking about career and, and um, experience and excitement and all of those things. Um, but it takes a little minute now to get to the sense of service. And I think that's lost. I will tell you that um, our president um, was on the right track. It's just a damn shame that this economy and the, the, the financial disaster is sidetracked uh, from where we were. A lot of people think this notion of like when Kennedy challenged this, this country about what you can do, right? What is it that you can do? A lot of us, um, a lot of us grew up in that generation, right? Of asking, you know, that was a real thing. What can you do for your community? And we've gotten away from that. Our president really tried to lead us back there before all this other craziness hijacked the, his, his message. Um, but I think that we can go back into our communities and say, what is it you're prepared to do? What is it that you're ready to do? And I most assuredly, please, don't hear me wrong, I'm not looking to try to get more police explorers. I'd love to have them. Um, I'm not trying to recruit more cops. I'd love to have you. But there has to be something elemental in your responsibility to your society, mm -hmm. to your society that we live in, that you're participating in for service. There has to be something. It's just not optional. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> so we're going to now move to the question and answer period. And don't be surprised. I can't help it if I build on your question or ask somebody, but we really want you to participate. Ask the hard questions, ask from your heart what you're thinking uh, about your community, about public safety, about our police department, fire department, civ civilian review board, our school system, whatever's on your mind and your heart that these folks um, can share their thoughts, opinions, and philosophies on. Because at the end of the day, our goal is to move to the place where we, also, where we talk about solutions, but we're also to collectively creating the Baltimore that we know that we can become. And your vision of Baltimore, my vision of Baltimore, these individual vision of Baltimore, we will create a hell of a city um, that we all can be proud of. So who has the question? Yes, sir. 
Uh, my name is Davon Love. Um, I graduated from Forest Park High School, um, and now I'm a student um, senior at Towson. Uh, my question is actually directed at Mr. Bryce. Um, I see that you're director of uh, student support um, and safety. I'm interested in what your office is doing to encourage more community participation and supporting students, because I think the point was made several times that mentorship and having adults, you know, really are some things that the, the, your office has done to encourage community support, and what are some things that community folks who've tried or who want to, you know, participate in the lives of students do? Because as a, as a graduate, you know, I've tried um, in many instances to get involved, and it's been very difficult just institutionally to get through a lot of the hoops and a lot of the bureaucracy in order to just try to have an effect on the life of students. So, so uh, let me start off by saying thank you for uh, your question. I won't hold the school you graduated from against you because you're at Towson now, all right? And so I, I, I graduated from Towson as well, so thank you. Um, in terms of community participation, uh, we're big believers that the, the ills that our young people come to school with cannot be resolved solely in the schoolhouse. It really does go back to what the commissioner says, what our CEO always says. We say that kids come as is. It's our job as a school system to sort of set the parameters, but to enlist the community in helping to repair whatever damage has been done to young people so they can be successful. So let me give you a couple of examples. So this year, this is the first year that we have required all secondary schools, all schools with grades six through 12 to have a youth development strategy. The reason why is because kids that do the best do the most. If kids are going home right after school, they're not involved, it goes back to what I said earlier, that if they don't have that engaging activity, then we run the risk of losing them to other pursuits that are not positive. And so we really focused and required all of our schools to have after school clubs, art, music, uh, drama, PE, robotics, you name it, because kids need activities to not only uh, keep them engaged, but also to develop their talents. In terms of how we work with community partners, I would say that my office um, spends considerable dollars uh, funding uh, community partners to do after-school programming for, uh, we fund Higher Achievement, which is an after-school program in an east side and west side middle school that are doing work with about 100 students in each location. We work with uh, groups like WombWorks uh, through our Youth Ambassadors Program to teach young people how to develop their own playmaking uh, uh, ability or theatrical skills. Um, and the list goes on and on because all of our schools are also doing the same types of things. In terms of trying to become uh, a member, what I would suggest, and I can give you my email address, I'll just give it to everybody, it's the letter J, B-R-I-C-E, at bcps.k12.md.us, send me an email, and I'll try to connect you to our Family and Community Engagement Office so that we can um, have you become one of our mentors and, and really be able to, to work directly with young people. Could, could I just yes. add something? I, there, there is such a critical need, and especially, especially in the African American community, and especially among, among male uh, role models uh, in, this, in, in this city. Big brothers and big sisters are desperate for that help. And it, it's not an overstatement to use the word desperate. Um, and we need to figure out the, the venues. I'm, I, I've hired people to try to help me hire 300 more cops. But we're, we're operating on volunteer dollars and uh, the mayor's tried to throw her political clout behind uh, big brothers and big sisters, but we need a lot of help and because these kids, it's hard for me as a middle-aged white guy to try to convince some a kid from the inner city that he can overcome all the, what the hell do I know about that? I mean, he, really, what the hell do I know about that? And um, it's, it, we need a lot of soldiers in that fight. And that, that would be a perfect way for people to help us out. Anybody else on the panel want to speak to this? Hey there, uh, my name's David Troy, and um, I'm on the board of Live Baltimore. And I'm 
was at a board meeting a few weeks ago, and I parked my bicycle out front, and I came out after the meeting to discover that it had been stolen. Um, certainly not asking you to end bike thefts in the city. There's only so much you can do. But um, the question that I had is I did report it to the police, and um, an officer arrived and took my report, um, stayed in his car the whole time, did not want to get out of his vehicle. Sure, it was a cold morning on Charles Street, um, but I felt as though the customer service experience that I received was adequate but underwhelming. And I feel like that one of the things that would really help the city is to really focus on customer service within the police department. And I know that that's something that you've been working on, Commissioner, but I wondered if you could speak to that and, and how you're going to go about improving that kind of customer service experience. Yes, yeah, so um, a, a great question. And, and I think it's at the core of it, right? Because, um, and, and I have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity here. There, just today, just this weekend, you will read a lot of comments about how the cops, the rank and file feel about this 2% wage reduction, about the pension reforms. And I've read with interest I know what they're saying, and God bless them, because these men and women, they work their, their hearts out. They really do. Um, but I'm reading with interest uh, uh, the comments attached to the stories, and I I'm not surprised by a single one. I think a lot of them will, because I've, I've been talking to them a lot over the last three years, and especially over the last year, about just this notion of customer service. So here's what I've said, and this has been my message. I've tried to tell them, and, and I'm trying to convince them, that they're ambassadors for the city. A lot of them don't want to be ambassadors, right? They just want to be cops, right? And, and uh, so I tell them that if I could teach them anything, like do away with the arrest and control and the shooting and constitutional law, that I would teach them a course in economics, right? Because here's the, here's the simple truth of it. There's no oil in the harbor. There's no gold out in Leakin Park. It is the residential base that drives the success and health of this city. That's the reality. And if you start creeping out to customers and you, you don't deliver good service, they've been on track for this for the last 20 years. They leave. And so when they stand there or they don't get their rear ends out of the car, and logical brains would come to that restaurant. And you think I'm being facetious, but you had, you, you had a very benign experience. I get calls, and the major gets calls uh, fairly frequently where people say, they, they hear cops saying at the scene of burglaries, that's why I don't live in the city. That's why I wouldn't come here without extra ammo. It all sounds good and amusing to them, but it creeps the people out and they take their word for it. And so what I'd rather they say, and what I'm, what I'm working to insist that they say, when they come to, to take the report on your bike, they say, I'm damn sorry this happened. When I, when I stood up and said I was sorry that Pitt Karen got murdered, I mean it. And I'm not just sorry that Pitt Karen got murdered. I'm sorry that the kid, while we were waiting for this, I'm sorry that the kid that got shot this afternoon in West Baltimore, I'm sorry that he got shot. And we ought to be, every, every man and woman that wears, we ought to be sorry your bike got stolen. Because it is, to some degree, it is, not to some, but a large degree, our responsibility. And I want them to come and say, I'm sorry that happened to you, and I'm going to work my tail off, one, to try to get your bike back. That's what I want them to say. And we've built a lot of training into that. I could go on about Diamond Standard. But at the core of it, they need to understand, and we, the leaders here, need to reinforce they are the ambassadors of this city. And uh, we need to do a much better job of communicating that. Yeah. Is that something that is on your radar? Or? Look, look, I'm just going to point to one example, right? I'm not thrilled about it. I, 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 have, um, I have a lot of my own personal baggage attached, right? But this notion, the, the case from the harbor, you remember that? Skateboarder. The, the skateboarder incident. Yeah. yeah. And so we had to set up, the department had to set up an alternative mailbox for not the, the hundreds, but the hundreds, hundreds of thousands of emails that poured in from around the world about how egregious that conduct was. 
And I've taken all kinds of hits about with the outcome of that case. I'd do it again tomorrow. I'd stand on it because at the end of the day, you know, uh, Mr. Bryce and I, early last week, we were at Curtis Bay Elementary Middle School. And the principal there is this lovely lady named Miss Avery. You know, she stood up and told her kids, she said, you got to be accountable. This whole notion about bullying in schools, that's what the seminar was about. She said, you get, you're going to be ac held accountable for your actions. And damn it, I've always I've stood straight and been accountable for my actions. People will be accountable. And um, so I think we are committed, not just by words, and I agree with you about the training. We have to reinforce it. When people step out of line, they're going to be held accountable, no matter how politicized or how dramatic those incidents might appear. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure I'm if we have the mic. I'm here. Um, I appreciate the compassion that I hear for Baltimore. Um, and I also know Baltimore to be a very powerful, self-learning, growing, experience and an incredible body of knowledge. I learned a lot of public safety stuff in the community before. If I miss the paper that day, I still know what's going on. Um, and I like what I hear about the personal connections. So what I would really like to know, I understand this from the commissioner, he just addressed it, and from Ms. Walker, but what is something that you've learned from a citizen of Baltimore or in doing your work in interacting with another individual in your work in Baltimore City that you have felt personally obligated to help carry forth into policy and into the way that you do things and into the way that you encourage your team to do things? That's a good question. I wish I had thought of it. Chief Clark. Um, City College. <coughs> the Baltimore City College graduate at your oh, center. Okay. <laughs> Baltimore and their high schools, I'm telling you. <laughs> we will hold that against That's her. That's right. <laughs> I think what we can learn from our customers, and I get in trouble for calling uh, the people that we serve customers um, internally, but I really believe that everyone we interact with as a firefighter is a customer of ours. Um, they pay our salary. Um, if somebody fall, if an old person falls and they're carrying some groceries in the house and we go there and we stabilize them and we take them to the hospital, is it okay for us to go in their house and put the groceries away and lock it up and make sure the keys get to the person at the hospital? Firefighters ask me that. Is it okay for us to do that? They have it in their heart to do it, but they're not sure whether there's a policy that allows them to do something like that. Is it okay to stop and help somebody change a tire when we're on a mission to get some fuel? Are those things okay? And what I'm telling them is, yes, everything that makes sense is okay. If you're doing something to help somebody and something goes wrong, I'm not coming after you. It's okay to help people. Is it okay to let somebody sit in the truck when it's pouring rain as they're sitting there at the, at the bus stop waiting for the bus, getting soaked? Yes, it's okay. Put them in the truck. Stay there for a few minutes until the bus comes. But you wouldn't believe how many people in our culture, and I think the police department may have the same issue, believe that there's some rule or it isn't okay by rule, so we can't be decent people when we're at work and do things that we would do when we're not at work. Why is that? And so I've got a book um, that's written by a crazy old fire chief from Phoenix. His name's Alan Brunacini. He's about 80 years old now. But he wrote a book with a lot of cartoons in it, a lot of pictures, not a lot of words, which is really good for us. <laughs> and it says, you know, basically, take care of people that you come across. If their house is on fire, put it out. But not only put it out, figure out a place to put the family while you're fighting the fire if they're standing outside in the cold. Knock on a neighbor's door. Um, take care of their stuff. You know, don't damage people's stuff unnecessarily. If somebody has a medical emergency, take care of the people around them, not just the person. If you have the resources, take care of people around them. So all of that is what I've learned, and I'm trying to um, get more of my... I'm not saying that everyone in the fire department doesn't understand this. There's a lot of people that do, and they do this every day. But there are people that um, possibly they live out in the suburbs, they live out in the county, they come in here for a paycheck and they go home to the nice quiet place in the woods somewhere 
and they don't really have that in their heart, or at least they don't feel like they need to act like a normal, compassionate human being. And so I think we can do a lot in all city agencies, not just the fire department. We can do a lot to be more human, to be more service-oriented. Sergeant, you look like you wanted to say something. Well, I was just, I was smiling because uh, the chief kind of stole my thunder a little bit. Um, <laughs> I was at a community meeting about three months ago um, trying to convince somebody not to leave because that's um, the message and that's, it's important that we don't lose people from the city. And uh, he asked me if I lived in the city. And um, that was an awkward <laughs> moment for me because I had to say, no, I don't, um, but you should stay. And uh, <laughs> Due to some circumstances in my life, I had the opportunity to move um, from my house, and I thought about it, and I said, if I am as committed as I say I am, and I'm going to be um, as dedicated to this job as I'm going to be, I should move into the city. So I did. Um, so I took that from the city. And more taxes. <laughs> yeah, more taxes. <laughs> so now I get to tell myself I pay my salary, That's which right. is a beautiful thing. You don't pay your salary. Anybody else want to share? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Um, Bryson, they will come to you. It, well. it, it's interesting. So as I sit here and listen to this, I, I thought about one of the young people that I met through our Great Kids Come Back campaign, which is the campaign where we go knock on doors of students that have dropped out trying to get them to come back. And so I met, meet this young man. He's about 18 or 19. Um, and his presentation was how shall we say, um, it, it was interesting, right? He had the full grill the, of the goals. Um, he, ha he was all tatted up. Um, That's the way I look on weekends. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but he said something that has stuck with me. He said, I had to leave because I thought that I wanted to be on the streets, but I realized that the streets, there was nothing there for me. And that's why we do this. We, the, the reason why we have brought back over 2,000 kids in the last three years who had dropped out, who were in the wrong schools, who weren't being successful, is, is because of that. It's because the kids don't actually want the life that, that they have chosen, and we have to give them another option. And if we fail to give them another option, then we relegate them to being in a place and doing things that, that most of them don't want to do. And so that's one of the things that, that I think we've learned from. Ms. Walker. Yes, in regards to the question that you asked about policy change or implementing certain policies, uh, and I'm glad to hear the question about customer service because of the Civilian Review Board, that has been a, something near and dear to us. We believe that uh, people are to be treated with respect and good customer service. I had a prior commissioner say to me he didn't want me to turn his lambs, his lions into lambs. And I said, well, you know, sir, people ought to be treated with respect. Respect calls for respect. If you want your officers to be respect, respected, then they need to respect the citizens. And a part of that has been abusive language. And somehow it's a little twisted that abusive language is only profanity but it's anything that is demeaning to you or makes you feel degraded in any way. And we have talked to commissioner after commissioners to, in fact, put a policy in place, some training in place for human relations, community relations, and sensitivity. And I'm glad to say that Commissioner Billfeld has done that. And as a result, some of our abusive language complaints have gone down as a result of making this request in writing that that be changed and that the customer service and the human relations part towards citizens be implemented. Very good. I think the microphone's in the back now. Oh, there it is. Uh, Fontaine Bell, I chair one of the mayor's uh, foreign sister cities in, in this particular case with China. Uh, but uh, my question is this, uh, and, and I'm one of these guys who live in the counties, but I, I worked, uh, retired in the city 25 years at one of the banks here, uh, so I've been a part of the city, and my mother's family is from Baltimore, so I have a long history. Um, a lot of the uh, views of Baltimore, and especially the police 
uh, department was shaped by this uh, PBS series, The Wire, that uh, came out a few years ago. And I'm just curious, uh, uh, from the professional's uh, perspective, how, how is that series regarded? Uh, is it an accurate portrayal? Is it, is it a travesty of our city? Um, uh, and that's my question. Wasn't it on HBO? HBO. Yeah, okay. We talked about this in the green room, about the perception of that show and how people outside of the city take that as gospel about how we live here in the city. So who wants to go first? Yeah, I'd Which, love to. <laughs> I, I think it's an incredible smear on this city that will take us decades to overcome. I, I think it, it is perhaps one of the most unfair uh, use of literary license um, that we've borne witness to. And, and I know those guys. I know David Simon, I know Ed Burns. Ed Burns used to work for me as a detective. So I, I know where their brains are, right? And so they can say what they want. And, I, and I've heard all this stuff about, well, you, you know, there's crime shows about L.A., there's crime shows about New York, there's crime shows about Miami. You know what Miami gets in their crime show? They get uh, detectives that look like models, and they drive around <laughs> in right. sports cars. Ferraris. And you know what, you know what Nor New York gets? They get, they get these uh, incredibly tough prosecutors and competent <laughs> cops that solve the most crazy and complicated cases at the end of a one hour episode. <laughs> but what Baltimore gets is this reinforced notion that, that it, it's a city full of hopelessness and despair and dysfunction. There, there was, without a doubt, a driving force in that, and there was very little effort, very little beyond self-serving effort to highlight the great and wonderful things that are happening here and to indict the, the whole population, the criminal justice system, the school system. Surely they picked out a character who was exemplary. They picked out a detective who was exemplary. They picked out one person in city government that was exemplary, or one reporter that had a moral compass. They left the rest of, not just the country, but the world. I went to Israel, and uh, I, I was, they, people wanted to talk to me, not about crime fighting or what we're doing about the things here. They wanted to talk to me about that stupid show. It's being translated, it's being translated, and now it's all the rigor in, in college universities to study the wire. I'd rather that they study Family Guy. That's what I'd rather they study. <laughs> if you want to real, if you want to really examine, if you want to really examine our country and what's at the core drives us, I don't think that you smear an entire city to make your point. Uh, I think it was ridiculous. Anyone else want to mention anything before we move on? Okay. No, uh, I think he said who it is, all. Mm -hmm. Who is the microphone? Oh. Who's our mic guy or girl? Let's pass it back. Keep going. There you go. So I, I have a quick um, follow-up to the policy question because I do think it is about um, policy and um, I'm a SOB, I like to say, son of Baltimore, so please pardon me for um, extending the question, but I grew up in a city that was a little bit different. I um, was glad to see Miss Walker there because she knew me when I was knee high, and I remember her office was one of the offices that I could go to for help. I think she worked for the Housing Authority, and I grew up in Cherry Hill in the housing projects, and um, you know, there were no less than four recreation centers in my neighborhood that I could go to every day, five days a week. There was a swimming pool, an indoor swimming pool, mind you, right up the street from my house. There was a sailing program that I participated in over the summer, and I tell people that in many ways, I had more opportunities than my daughter has in terms of what happened. So I do think I'm an educator, I'm a principal, and I know Mr. Bryce, but this is a bigger conversation, and it starts before we even get to these fine people on this panel. There are some policy issues that we have allowed to um, 
not happen or um, with regard to the, the, the fact that the recreation centers and other things don't exist anymore and we need to all work hard to return those types of opportunities to our young people and I guarantee you, you'll have less people dropping out, you'll see less criminals, you'll see uh, less people that you all have to intervene in because they're in gangs, but we've got to stop this uh, assault on our community that prevents those, the least of these, from uh, accessing and having a better life. Anybody? Yeah, can I comment on that? So, so um, I've been on two task force for the mayor, uh, one for her transition when she uh, took office, and the other is the task force about recreation and parks. And there were a couple of huge things, and it's going to be a, a report that comes out if it hasn't already landed. Um, but one of the things is that in Baltimore, we have an idealized uh, history about recreation centers. We re remember recreation centers when we were in, uh, in growing up, when we were young people, as these places where kids wanted to show up, there was always something to do, it was a great opportunity. Well, increasingly, uh, recreation centers are underutilized. And so the issue in our city is not necessarily about recreation centers, and I like how you phrased it, it's about the opportunity. It's about the opportunity for young people to be engaged in positive activities. And the only way that we're gonna be able to do that is as a community, we decide that uh, the cost of playing baseball is going to not be as expensive as it currently is. The cost of participating in Pop Warner football or, or, or dance or, 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 or whatever. And so as a society, we've gotten to the point where for the average parent, it is expensive to have your child in after school or weekend activities where the entry fee costs 100 bucks plus equipment. My daughter wanted to play uh, uh, soccer so she had to get the, the shin guards and the mouthpiece and all this other stuff, and thankfully we could afford it, but the reality is there are other people in this city who aren't able to afford it. Their children go without, and left to their own devices, they are gonna be the young people that we're gonna see later on. So as a community, we really do have to decide, even in these austere, fiscal, uh, fiscally constrained times, where we're gonna place our money. Are we gonna put our money up front and pay it for young people to do positive things or are we gonna pay it at the, at the tail end when we are dealing with young people that need to be incarcerated? And I would take it one step further before the next person asks their question. We are really good at complaining. We're really good at pointing out all these problems, but we don't require the people who have the decision-making power to make our children, to make our priority their priority. We may go to a community meeting and say, we want rec centers, we want programs for kids, and they look at you and they smile and they share your priority, but then they don't do anything. And our memories are such that we forget. That's right. And we let them off the hook. I agree, we don't need a rec center in every community. We've gotta be smart about how we um, provide programs for our children, but our children deserve opportunities. Yep. And when an elected official, and I work for elected officials, so I, I may get fired actually, I say, but when I, <laughs> <laughs> but when an elected official does not make our children a priority, we should not forget every election cycle we return these people to office. And no one goes through the checklist and say, wait a minute, you were supposed to provide opportunities for our children in this community. Check. You didn't do it. You were supposed to help men get jobs. You didn't do it. You were supposed to make sure that um, women felt safe in their homes. You didn't do it. You were supposed to do what we elected and are paying you to do. And we forget every cycle. We, we, we reelect the same people over and over and over again. And you know the definition of insanity is doing that over and over and over again, expecting something different. Our commissioner talks about accountability. Our chief talks about accountability. We have to be accountable for the decisions we make. And that's who also represents and governs our city. You have to make a smart choice. Don't make the political choice. Make a choice with your self-interest in mind. That's what we have to start doing. I'm getting off the topic. Yes, um, how are you? My name is Willie Flowers and I'm the Executive Director of the Park Heights Community Health Alliance. My question is actually for the, the Chief. 
Um, and I'll share a, a fairly challenging experience I had with the city. First of all, I'm not from Baltimore, and I didn't go to the schools. I wasn't born here, but um, part of Baltimore has been born in me, particularly in what I do with health advocacy. But um, a few years ago, and everybody who's been here for a while saw the um, challenges that the police department faced um, during a period. And um, ironically, I, I've been here long enough to have it, seen it change. And I was, quite frankly, had a challenge, um, fairly very bitter challenge, because I spent six hours in the police uh, central booking because I was arrested uh, what, on a situation that was uh, kind of, I guess it was a, because of aggressive police strategy. But what I did notice and what I was a part of, and I've been here long enough, like I said, to experience that um, maybe three years ago, uh, because of a, my position at uh, uh, Sinai Hospital at the time, that I was able to arrange for an award ceremony for a program that doesn't get a lot of press, and I don't, I don't know why, but apparently when the chief got into office, he changed the police strategy. I don't know if it was a situation between him and the mayor at the time, or just everything moving in a different direction. But the police strategy changed. And if you've been around, you knew that there were a lot of people getting arrested just for doing, standing in the parking lot. Um, but that has changed. So my question is to the chief, what happened, what was the assessment before, and what did you do to alter that paradigm? Because it, it does make Baltimore a much better city. So at first, Mr. Flowers, I, when you said chief, I was hoping it was Chief Clapp. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll answer. <laughs> no, no, no. I, um, okay, so he, he, you have to understand, right? I've been in this business. I've been uh, a city cop for 30 years, right? And I, I tell my men that I'm, I'm not so much a visionary and I'm not a criminologist and I don't think I'm a particularly smart guy. Um, but what I am is an incredibly good historian. And I know where we have failed. I know where our policing strategies have failed. So you, you highlight, and I, I won't miss this opportunity to get a fact out, because I believe facts overcome perception. They start breaking down uh, perceived notions. In 2005, as you alluded to, our police department um, uh, set about an aggressive enforcement strategy that resulted in the arrest of over 108,000 adults. Mm -hmm. On a population of 660, it was like the all-time record in law enforcement anywhere per capita. Uh, 108,000 adult arrests. In that, now, the, now the notion was, the theory was, developed by the leadership of the police department and our government, was that if you arrest more people, i.e. black men, you could drive down the murder rate in Baltimore. In that year, in 2005, Baltimore finished with a, um, a, a, an arrest total, I mean a homicide total, of 269 people. So 108,000 arrests, 269 murders in Baltimore. I was here. I had a front row seat to it. And in my world, I led the charge in East Baltimore, and we did as, as, as uh, our leadership directed. In 2008, my first full year here, we set the lowest homicide rate up until last year that the city had seen in, in uh, 20 years, over 20 years. Uh, that was 234. And we did it that year by arresting actually fewer people than we had the year before. And each year since I've been here and had control of this ship, we've either sustained the homicide rate or as we did last year, take it to levels nobody has seen in the last 27 years now. And we've done it by arresting fewer and fewer and fewer people. Last year, this city police department arrested less than 65,000 adult arrests. We set the lowest juvenile mortality homicide rate in nearly four decades and did it by arresting a thousand fewer juveniles in 10 than we did in 09. And so when, when I go around talking about targeted enforcement and bad guys with guns and trying to focus not just the community and politicians' attention 
I really do believe and absolutely convinced, like, like Miss Walker knows, and you knew growing up in Cherry Hill, it's not everybody that grew up in Cherry Hill. You want to talk about an indictment, try growing up in Cherry Hill, right? Cherry Hill, even in the African American community, had, had a bad rap. But it's not everybody in this city that's driving crime. It's not every young black man in this city that's driving crime. It is a small number, and we'll figure it out and get more precise and more precise because there is a more, there is a better way of not exercising police authority but holding people accountable for bad stuff in this city. Commissioner, what do you think of the criticism that you've gotten in some quarters of our city? You use language like thugs and uh, some other colorful yeah. language um, yeah. to describe people who are committing crimes in our city, and some people have criticized you publicly. Yeah. They, they have, and I'm, I won't stop. And I'll tell you why I won't stop. Because, uh, frankly, I, and if, if you really listen, right, Anthony, because you and I have had a chance to talk and work together for a long time, I'm just as likely to criticize or call myself a knucklehead for something that I've done. And so to, people need to get over this notion, well, I think it's just a code word for this or that. It's not a code word. I just believe when people are stupid, they're dumb. I believe when you've done something dumb, you're just a knucklehead. And when, I, when you go out and you mash people up and take their lives, I think you are some sort of homicidal maniac. And I think that the victims' families, they don't get a chance to be, talk to Jane Miller. They don't get a chance to be at press conferences behind podiums. And I feel that I must speak for somebody in this city. And I must say that I think there are gangs of, of irresponsible thugs that disproportionately contribute and tear at the fabric of our city. And I'm just not gonna make apologies or try to be politically correct about the maniacs that do that. I just, I think that when we start getting into that, we start treading on dangerous ground about excusing people's behavior. We ought to be committed to programs. We ought to be committed to great education. What we shouldn't be committed to is excusing the heinous things that individual people do. There's the microphone here. Yeah, right here. So, okay, thanks for the inspiration, too, because this actually has been an inspirational panel as you all have talked about your personal philosophies. Um, but I'm a systems guy, so my question is always about systems. Um, can you talk about, because by the time that people get to the police department or you're putting out a fire, you know, something has happened to get them there. Can you talk about how you're thinking about the systems that are affecting people's options and opportunities and the choices that they make? before they get to you? And how are you looking, because obviously you just did a brilliant example of a best practice, right? How are you looking at best practices from, and most promising practices from other areas so that you're informed in your thinking, not only in your department, but as it relates to interdepartmentally? Yeah, I, I'm gonna be really quick. I'm gonna give you one. We, New York City um, is enjoying the lowest, uh, some of the lowest levels of violent crime that they've seen in four decades, and they've, they've continued that progress over an expanded period of time. There's a lot of theories about why it is zero tolerance, all of this demographic makeups. I, I've heard a, a lot of it. So we borrowed, one of the things that I think is effective, and we've tried to, on a system-wide basis, is, a, is around bad guys with guns, not just a sound bite. So let me tell you a systems orientation. We borrowed from New York City, it was the only place in the country that had it, the gun offender registry. We were able to convince the city council to adopt it, only the second place in the nation. And currently, Baltimore City has more people on its gun offender registry than New York City with a population of over 7 million people. So that will tell you something about uh, the scope of the problem, right? So now here's the system orientation. One is, it's not enough just to have those guys coming in and they're under increased scrutiny. The system involves two facets. One is that we ratchet up the psychological impact to the offender. And the way we do that is we make them famous. I talk about them endlessly. I pinch commanders about what they're doing by way of checks. 
sergeants make sure that their post officers go out. You know what they got to do? They got to knock on that guy's door. And they're saying, we're here just to tell you we love you. Right? <laughs> we're here. And I want them doing that once a month. So now in the systems world, what I'm hoping is that this guy, he figures out that he's under so much scrutiny that he stops carrying a gun. That's all I want him to do. I just want him to stop. Right? The second part is this notion about, about how to get away from 108,000 arrests and down to holding individual people accountable. What I know is 44% of all the people we charge with homicide, and the numbers are same for robberies and non-fatal shootings, is the same guys with guns over and over again. So you gotta make them famous to the cops too. So when they're driving around, they're not on loudspeakers saying, everybody get down. We're going to arrest everybody on the corner. What I want them to get out and say is, you, sit your rear end down. Well, why are you messing? I'm messing with you because you're on the gun offender registry, and you're hanging out on this corner, and I want to make sure you don't have a gun. It sends a clear message of prioritization to the community. The cop recognizes who these bad guys are, and it, we discourage them by way of a systematic approach to ending the, the ridiculous violence. Because at the end of the day, the last caveat, these guys aren't getting killed over multi-kilo drug deals. The shootings aren't over multi-kilo drug deals. It's a very rare exception. You know what they're over? The, uh, the, the young man from Forest Park. They're over, tell them what the R word is. Uh, respect. respect. That's what it's all about. You disrespect, you're wearing this, you're wearing, you like that, your dog's bigger, your car, it's respect. These guys shoot each other just over dumb stuff. And if you can disconnect and separate them from that gun, the availability of that weapon to resolve that dumb dispute, I kind of like my chances. That's how we're going to keep making the city safe. Okay, schools? And then yeah, so in terms of systems thinking, uh, we do a ton of that, and so I'll just give you an example. Um, in terms of how we got to the point where we have decreased the dropout rate, uh, specifically for African American males, increased their graduation rate, um, that is pretty astounding nationally. Uh, five points. One, it really is through how we have chosen to fund schools through fair student funding. Uh, two, it's because we have as a strategy we close bad schools. Bad schools should not be allowed to continue to exist and we should not relegate students to attend those schools because let's be honest, none of us in this room would send our child to a bad school and I'm, I'm on the cabinet. I certainly wouldn't send my kid to a bad school. Why should I allow someone else's child to go to an equally bad school? The work that we've done around re reducing uh, disruption in behavior. And so when you talk about best practices, we actually borrowed this practice from um, the, the police department. We review, we have something called safety stat. We review every incident of suspension and school police arrest every Friday at 11 o'clock. You know why? Because we need to find out what school is having, a, is trending in a way that needs additional resources, additional input, from, from our office so that we can make sure that kids are gonna be successful. Um, last but not least, as we look at all of those things related to the dropout, we had to create additional options for our young people to go to. It's, it does us no good to close schools and not open places that parents want to go to. And so the commissioner mentioned that people have been leaving the city for 20 years. Well, prior to three years ago, enrollment in city schools had decreased for the last 40 years. So let me tell you what parents do, because it's really not about moving out of Baltimore. The first sign that something in the city is not working is when parents refuse to send their children to the public schools. And so we had to send a very clear message to parents that we were going to work our tails off to improve all of our schools so that our schools become places where you can trust and you can send your child to. And so because of that, in the last three years, we've seen enrollment increase in three years. Now, do I think it's just because our schools are better? No. 
Does the economy have a role to play? Certainly, but, but I would ask everybody to remember this. There have been recessions all over the last 40 years and enrollment still did not increase. So it really points to the work that we're doing from a systems approach to address these issues. And then Chief Clark, and then we're gonna talk community policing very quickly with the guardian angels and the sergeant and the major. And then we'll get one more question in, then final comments from the panel, okay? So Chief Clark, he's talking systems. What have you been doing at the fire department to address issues and problems? Well, one of my primary jobs is to make sure I'm, I'm doing environmental scans all the time and seeing what's going on in the fire service around the country. And I'll give you, I could talk the rest of the night about initiatives, but I'll give you a real solid one that I think affects everybody in the room, and that's smoke alarms. Um, we've had them for decades. And uh, how many of you remember the change your clock, change your battery? Mm -hmm. Okay. How many people did that? Very few. Um, no matter how much we said it, uh, it didn't happen. And so we started thinking about that as a fire service. How can we make this thing more reliable? I can show you homes in this city that have six or seven carcasses of smoke alarms uh, of all ages. And so what we said is, th this we can't keep doing this. So we, we went to the manufacturers and said, we need something different. They came out with a 10-year lithium battery smoke alarm that's locked so you can't get in it and get the battery out of it. And in 10 years, we'll take it down and screw up a new one. That's, that's going to save lives because we know that people, once that thing's up there, they forget about it unless it chirps and then they knock it off the wall rather than buying a battery. And so now we've got this, this system, this protection system that's going to actually last for a while and people don't have to pay attention to it and maintain it. So we have about 15 minutes left before we have to wrap off and be off the stage. So we wanted to make sure a very important issue is com community policing, some of the programs and things that are going on and taking place in the public safety arena, not just in the police department, but creative, incredible things that think people like the Guardian Angels are doing. Neighborhoods have set up committees and other things where they're actually bringing people together. Not just meetings, but community walks, they're talking to their neighbors, they're getting to know each other. I actually drove by over in Oliver the other day and saw a police officer sitting on the steps with an elderly lady just talking. And I said, we're doing something right. And so April wanted to make sure that the Guardian Angels had a chance to talk about the importance of community policing building relationships, and of course the sergeant and the major are intimately involved in building those kind of relationships. So if you all could take just a couple of minutes to share uh, those, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and why it's important to public safety. We'll start with you, Marcus. Okay. One of the things <clears throat> that I think a lot of people don't know about the Guardian Angels, that, that if you hear the name Guardian Angels, you automatically think that, that we're a bunch of guys and, and girls that walk through the neighborhoods and all they do is just look for crime and all this. They don't have any kind of special powers and all that. Well, in a way, you're kind of right. Now, like I said, Taps and I, my twin brother, were part of the original Guardian Angels. When the Guardian Angels were made up of martial artists and all these special fighters that went through the neighborhoods, but there was no community involvement. As of 2006, we restarted the chapter. We have over 160 Guardian Angel chapters all over the world. We have 29 chapters alone in Japan. We have three in South Africa. And those chapters over there are basically funded by their government because they've done such a great job. The Guardian Angels here in uh, Baltimore, one of the things that, that we, we do is now, now remember as a whole, out of all these 160 chapters all over the world, there's still one, one guy that runs the Guardian Angels, which is Curtis Sliwa out of New York City. Every week, I get a phone call from Curtis Sliwa. He calls everybody. He comes down here maybe once every four months or so or if I need him. The Guardian Angels, over the 32 years that they've been involved, one of the things they did was, okay, we are, we're in Baltimore. Now, we may have a guy down here in Baltimore, we may have a neighborhood that's got a gang problem that goes someplace else. These guys leave, they go to D.C. The chapter commander of the Guardian Angels in D.C. will call me and say, hey, Strider, we got a guy down here who used to live in Baltimore. Can you tell us something about him? And all the chapters pretty much talk about this. So we have our own, we have our own ranking systems we know, in the Guardian Angels. We have our commanders, our patrol leaders, and all this. We have people that do nothing all day but sit around and, and send me emails on who's been shot, who's been hurt, what the community violence is. I got one guy that just does that all day. And each chapter has this. So we're pretty much networked. Over the 32 years, we've been able to put this system together so well 
that I can call the chapter command of D.C. or New York or Pennsylvania and say, hey, there's a guy down here that may be living up your way or has family up your way. Give me some information about him. Those, those guardian angels go to their police department or go to their neighborhood associations, and we can follow this guy all the way around. Uh, I got a call two weeks ago from York, Pennsylvania, about a guy who, who went up there that they, that they grabbed hold of that had family here in Baltimore. They had this guy, and they said, hey, one, you know, this guy apparently was carrying guns in PA. He was a pain in the neck, but they can't lock him up. They're not cops. And the guy said, well, you, can, you, know, you can't do nothing to me. He says, we know everything about you. Called me up, gave me all his information, then I called him back and told him where his family lived in New York, Pennsylvania. So we have a great networking system over the 32 years. There's so much that the guardian angels do now as opposed to just patrolling. And one of the things we do in Baltimore is my favorite thing to do is, is to go out and spread community awareness. I talk about what, what we can do in our communities as far as going to our local politicians and, and holding them accountable for what they do and what they don't do. If you have a neighborhood that's full of crime and all this, I can reach out to the police. You got a political leader out there when your streets are falling apart, then we can reach out to them as well. So we, we, we try to use the guardian angels to do whatever we can to help empower that community. But the biggest thing for me in, in my chapter is the awareness. You know, when uh, Commissioner Bielfeld first came aboard, one of the first things he did was he, he sent me and a couple of my, my uh, angel leaders to the 911 center. You know, we go to communities all the time, and everybody talks about the stop snitching thing, they talk about the wire, they talk about this, which pretty much made us famous among our peers, guardian angels all over the place. You guys got this stop snitching. Every community we go to, we know this guy who did this and did that, but I'm not gonna say anything because I don't want to end up like the Dawson family. People are afraid. So I called the commissioner, he said, look, why don't you go to the 911 center, find out how you do the anonymous calling thing, and then we'll work on that. And, and we did that, so we go to communities, here, this is how you say something. This is how you put things together. We've had uh, gang training through uh, the Maryland Crime Prevention Committee, we, Homeland Security. So we try to reach out to as many people as we can so that we can learn as much as we can so that when we're out there, we can actually say, okay, here, this is what we know, and we don't make it up. We don't try to be the police officers. We don't try to be doctors or lawyers. And of course, we have lawyers that tell us what we can and cannot do. So the guardian angels, I think, especially this chapter, has done so well with the community relations that one of the things that the founder of the Guardian Angels did was said, took our blueprint on how we did things, which is really simple. All we did was pay attention to what goes on in the community. And we, and we, we uh, duplicated that throughout, throughout the areas. And we just opened another uh, sub-chapter under Baltimore in the Richmond chapter. And these guys have been open less than a year and they've already won community awards for the changes that they've made. And I, I encourage everybody, like I said, you don't have to join the angels, you don't have to join the police, but if you go into your community and you pay attention for at least two, three hours or something, you find out what's going on in there, you're gonna open up yourself to a whole new network of things, and, and you're gonna make that community better. Marcus, and, we're gonna have to move on. Oh, okay, well. Great answer, ahead. very thorough. <laughs> uh, but to the major and the sergeant, excuse me, <clears throat> if you could share what you're doing and why community policing is important, community partnerships, your answers are going to have to be pretty short, unfortunately, because we're running out of time. And we're going to end right at 5 o'clock like we're supposed to. Okay, so I, what I'll just say is I, I really think that I'm, I'm going to let the sergeant speak on the programs <clears throat> that we have. But I really think that uh, Marcus, I don't think we'll understand. This is his volunteer job. He actually works full time and raises a whole family. So he does the guardian angel thing on his own time. And his involvement with us is on a weekly basis that he's at a walk or one of his angels are at one of our walks. So it's his involvement that have made us so successful. But uh, Sergeant Kowalczyk can speak to the programs that we have in the Southern District. So um, networking makes the world go around. And that's kind of the philosophy that we have that we try to run out of our office. And we do that through two ways. It's what can we do for you and what can you do for us? Um, we have a couple programs where we try to engage the community and get them involved. Um, one of them is our nuisance abatement program and one of them is our Dear John program. Um, we have a couple neighborhoods where prostitution is an issue. So um, we worked with the communities to create just a really simple sheet. And when they see a car drive into the neighborhood and the car looks like it's trying to pick up a prostitute, they write down the license plate number, they send it to us. We send a letter out. Um, it's actually been a really, really successful program. We've sent out um, Officer Dyson, who's hiding in the back back there, um, runs the program for our office. We've sent out almost 300 letters now. We've gotten two complaints about those, um, the letters. Somebody called and said that, the, that it wasn't their car. So out of 300 letters, we're, we're doing pretty well on that program. Um, of course it I, wasn't their car. I, I don't think I'd want to be in that house when the letter <laughs> arrived, but it's, it's a way to engage the community. 
Um, and when I go and I talk about this program, what I say is, there's only so many of us, but everybody out here has a cell phone. Everybody out here lives in this neighborhood. There's 40 houses on this block and one of them look for that car trying to pick up a prostitute. They're gonna be looking for other things too. So they're gonna be more observant. They're gonna see things. That's where community policing really becomes important from a, um, from a law enforcement perspective. It gives us that many more eyes out there. Um, one of the, what we try to give back is we do, we engage in programs. We have the Explorer program where we um, take in kids 14 to 21 to, and we do, um, structured activities with them and, and it's an incredible program. I wish we could get more kids involved in it. Um, and we teach them law enforcement tactics. It's not about becoming a police officer. It's run through the Boy Scouts of America, but it's a great program that um, our officers volunteer their time towards uh, uh, being mentors for people. We do food basket programs. Um, we work with the hospitals and churches in our districts to do different uh, um, picnics and things like that, the businesses, stuff like that. So it's, it's I, I could go yes, on. I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we're out of time, unfortunately. We're going to have our final remarks from our um, Civic Frame um, founder and uh, the creative Amplified Baltimore. Let's give. Well, you make yeah, I, I want to make. But you, I want to give you this caveat. Okay, okay thank I admit it to them before we came down. I'm a, I'm a really control freak. Your final remarks, I want all of you, we'll just run away. Make your final remarks, but they have to be less than 30 seconds. Mine is less than 30 seconds. Perfect. In so our community, community policing. We have something called nosy neighbor. I believe everybody needs a nosy neighbor. So start a nosy neighbor campaign in your community. Chief Clark, any final thoughts? I just want to thank everybody for coming out today on a Saturday and hanging in there all day. I understand some of you have been here all day. So that kudos to you. Marcus. Thanks for having us here and get involved. Sergeant. Same thing. Thank you for having us and get involved. Major. Thanks for having us. Just be a part of it. Hey, Baltimore is a great city. Uh, go back and let everyone know that. Thank you. Um, just remember, great kids, great schools, and the, the better our children do, the better our city will do as a whole. God never gives us a vision without provision. I'm a little emotional because I'm, I'm drugged up and I'm tired. <laughs> um, legal drugs. Legal drugs. Um, but I have to say that um, this panel was so extraordinary and I'm so glad it's being videotaped and we'll be able to share it with so many people because I think you probably thought that you're going to have a conversation about crime and grime and everything that was wrong with the city. But I don't think you expected to get a philosophical and spiritual understanding about how these people engage their work. And that is nothing short of extraordinary. And I believe there's a reason why I lost my voice because you did a masterful job at moderating this panel. And I want to thank you for that. So thank you all for being here. Um, we had a lot of people here today who came through all kinds of reasons why they couldn't be here or shouldn't be here. We have an audience of folks who are watching us on the internet from their homes. And I am so grateful that you all are a part of this process. This is only gonna grow. I can see already from how you've articulated why you're here, why you're committed to this, that this movement is just getting started and it's gonna really shift how we see ourselves as the people of Baltimore, but it's also gonna shift how people see us as a city and how they see their possibilities in other cities. I've gotta tell you, um, before the first program, I got calls from Houston and Newark and Philly and other cities across the country come amplify our city. And I've got to tell you that um, I'm a little black girl that was born in Westport, Mount Winans, so you know I got a lot of Southern District up here, I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandmother still lives there, as anybody that's with me on Facebook knows on Waterview Avenue. And um, nothing gets started with me unless it gets started in Baltimore. So we can't do this here, we can't do this anywhere. And it's already a, you know, can is already out of the dictionary, it's already out of the vocabulary because we're doing it. And I'm so um, inspired by each of you and everybody that's lent their name to this effort that we're starting this in such a powerful way. If you listen to the language that we use today, it's already different. There are so many people who came up to me, I think we should do this and I think we should do that. Look, I'm telling you right now, this is a series of conversations that is first about changing our language, about what we say about ourselves, about how we speak about ourselves, about how we speak to one another. So 
if I can do nothing else with your help, with these conversations, I want us to have the conversations based on power, based on generativity, based on being compassionate with one another first, and then thinking about what does our past say about who we are? What does our present say about who we are? But what power do we have as individuals and as a collective community to come together to make our city great? I already know it's great because it created me and it created many of you. And, it, and it's a place that you all choose as your home. And we have this type of leadership. I mean, I don't care what you think of the fire chief or the police chief, these people put their lives on the line every day for the citizens of Baltimore. And that's an extraordinary thing. And for them to come out in the snow when all kinds of things are happening in the city, to have these kind of conversations consistently means that they we, we are in a city of so many people who are ex extraordinarily committed on such a higher level. And we need to really start to validate that and to acknowledge the power of that and to support that. So with this panel, I say to you, all of the rest of the work that we do in March, in June, in September, in 2012, because yes, you have come up to me with other topics. <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of work to do. This work requires you getting other butts in the chairs, other butts in the chairs. It requires that we raise money because this place costs, the people who are doing work, they cost money. If you wanna eat, that costs money. Um, and it requires that we shift our hearts, we shift our minds about who we are and who we wanna be. And I think we've already started that in a powerful way and I can't thank you enough. I know that each of you will become an ambassador for this movement in a very powerful way. I have to thank some people because again, there are people who are just doing stuff for free all over the place to make this work. Um, <clears throat> my mom's, I'm gonna thank my mom, my grandmother, my sister. My cousin Caprice Martin-Smith who put me in contact with Major Barilaro who is just, this woman put together this panel basically. <laughs> so thank you so much, you gave me so much incredible advice. None of these panels are done because they're in my head. I call up because I'm a citizen that says, I'm confused, I have no clue how this works, but you tell me. I wanna say that because there's nothing that I'm doing that everybody in this audience and everybody that's watching can't do. As a matter of fact, I charge you with it and I expect it. So you might not be doing it at Micah, you might be doing it at your church, you might be doing it at your synagogue, you might be doing it at your temple, wherever you do it. You could be doing it at your kitchen table, right? Wherever you can do it. This is not rocket science. This is you having the collective will to say, there's something about the city of Baltimore, there's something about my community that I don't know about. I did not know any of these people from a can of paint, and what did I do? I sent you an email and said, will you please come out? And there's something about the language that I use that got people to say yes, yes, and amen. It's the power of your word. Your word creates a world. What kind of world do you want to live in? Think about that whenever you say anything out of your mouth, whenever there's a thought in your head. Think about the fact that you are creating life or death in that thought or in that word. Okay, back to thank yous, I'm sorry. Y'all know I went to Harvard Divinity School, I preach every now and then. I've got to thank the president of this institution who did not know me from a can of paint. And I walked into his room and said, hey, I want your space. I know it costs a lot of money, but we have no money. We're gonna have these conversations. And he said, yes. So Fred Lazarus, I thank you. Um, tons of board members, thank you. Yes, clap for them. <clears throat> tons of board members, uh, Pat and Janine Turner, Eris Melissa Rados, Mike Caliazzo, all of the wonderful folks at the ARS Institute, that was really the seed that started this entire movement and I'm grateful for that salmon lunch at Delano Tate because this is how all of this got started. So I want to thank Mike and Eris. Um, Wendy Emmerich and um, Integrated Designs designed all the branding that you see for free and trust me, I got on their ever-loving nerves because literally half the people on this panel came a couple days ago. <laughs> so we got to thank them. Um, Brett McCabe, a whole bunch of reporters. Um, there are people who are volunteering who didn't even get to see the panels who are downstairs. Corey Ramos of Ramos and Associates and Denise Daldron who works at Morgan State University, Zandra Carson, um, Sarita Oaks Murray, um, there are Mark Fuller, a whole bunch of my friends who have just been working with me nonstop to help, help, help out with this. Um, two of my newer friends that I couldn't do without at this point, um, Dave Troy and Nate Mook who 
literally put this on live stream so that you all who are not here could see it. I can't thank you enough for providing that um, as another avenue that I would never have thought of because I'm such a non tech so thank you. Um, Scott Burkle, who's helped us get press, and a ton of other people who are named here, uh, Kirk Spikes and a whole bunch of people who stayed all day. Um, the money people, gotta acknowledge the money people again. Associated Black Charities, the President's Roundtable, <laughs> Respira Medical, Eric Lee Bryant, Conan Productions and the Supreme Dream Team, Mike Galeazzo, Morgan Wheeler, InKind, David Trapea and Nate Mook, Innovative Design Enterprises Inc., Integrated Design Inc., Mass Transit Administration of Maryland, the Maryland Institute College of Art, and the Park Heights Community Health Alliance. We need more of your support, we need more of your help, and we need you to constantly amplify Baltimore. Thank you so much for being here for our main voice and coming back.